Okay. Wow, okay. Um, welcome to the June 15th, 2021 planning board meeting. As a result of the COVID-19 virus, the planning board will conduct the meeting via remote access as provided by Maine law. The planning board will use Zoom meeting to conduct the meeting and to allow the public to uh, remotely attend and participate. Zoom will allow all planning board members, applicants, and members of the public to hear all discussion and hear votes, which will be taken by roll call as required by law. Okay, first item on the business, approval of min uh, minutes. We've got two, min uh, two minutes, one from the May 18th, 2021, and one from the June 1st uh, special meeting at the workshop. So do I have any comments? Yes, Go I ahead. have a comment. Um, yep. I, th I think the uh, minutes of May 18th mistakenly say April 20th. Yes, I saw that. If nobody said it, I was going to bring that up. So you that was corrected that. That's OK. That was my first comment. And then on the minutes of June 1st, it says Mr. Shalat called the meeting to order. Usually I get a phone call or an email when I'm fired, but you know, <laughs> it's kind of a hard way to, to learn. Uh, so those were um, the two changes I had to the minutes. OK. All Sorry right. about that, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else? So I guess we'll, uh, hearing none, uh, I guess we'll have two separate roll calls. I guess I assume, Maureen. Yes, please. Motion we accept the uh, May 18, 2021 um, minutes as amended. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Maureen, please call the roll. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Palmer? I'm going to abstain since I didn't attend the meeting. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. And Chair Hubner? Yes. Do we have a uh, motion for the, uh, for the June 1st special meeting? Minutes? Motion we accept the June 1st, 2021 workshop um, minutes as amended. I'll second. Do have a motion to second? Maureen, please, any discussion? Please call a roll. Marie. Mr. Budensky? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Ms. Palmer? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Chair Hubner? Yes, the motion passes. Both motions passed unanimously. All right, the uh, second item on the agenda, the Town Farm Trail Resource Protection Permit. The Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a resource protection permit to construct 1,100 square feet of boardwalk on the existing Town Farm Trail R5-11 uh, and 13, section 19-8-3, resource protection permit public hearing. Okay, do we have somebody um, from the town to discuss it? I guess, Corinne, I see you. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Keeper. I am joining Let's... here as a member of the Conservation Commission to oh. encourage uh, to encourage the Planning Board to um, move ahead with our draft recommendation for the resource protection permit to construct boardwalks on the town farm trails. Okay, thank you. I, guess, I, I jumped the gun a little. I guess I thought you might have been from the uh, to, uh, to present the project, but uh, that's fine. Um, do, so is anyone here to actually present? Present it? Um, the, Ms. Ketchum is the conservation committee representative who would be available to both uh, answer oh. questions. Okay, I misunderstood, Corinne, I'm and, sorry and about I, that. And I am pulling up that application in case anyone would like to ask questions about it. Okay. I guess, uh, all right. So Corinne, are you willing and able to actually present this or are you not the right person for that? 
Um, I don't have a presentation prepared for you. Um, however, I can certainly discuss that the Conservation Commission enlisted FB Environmental to do assessment of the Greenbelt Trails in Cape Elizabeth. Um, they have rated them on high priority, medium priority, and low priority. Um, our high impact, heavily trafficked trails include, include a section of Cross Hill, Goldcrest, and a majority in Town Farm Trail. Um, the Conservation Commission has already moved forward with um, trying to acquire DEP permits. And we are now um, intending to have actually have the assistance of the Boy Scout Troop 30 to help with uh, labor and move forward with being able to construct this boardwalk with the permit okay. Jim, Jim, didn't we hear about this last meeting? See, boys, I'm getting bad feedback. Is anybody else getting that? Yes. Okay. Uh, it again, Jonathan. Jim, I was just saying, didn't we hear a presentation on this last last meeting? Yes, yes we, we did. Just uh, even approving it then. So I, that's true. That's true enough. Okay, so then let's open this up to the public hearing to see if anybody has any comments. Um, I guess people listening in on Zoom, if you want to make any comments, please use the raised hand raise hand feature so we can. Uh, Get you in the system here. I see Philip Matthew from Celt has his hand up. Um, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. I will be brief. I'm Philip Matthew representing the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. As you may or may not know, we hold a conservation easement on most of Town Farm, if not all of it. Um, and we think that this project is great and is being done with good care and following sort of the standards that we expect on all trails in Cape Elizabeth. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Did anybody else have any comments from the public? Uh, seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Um, does anybody in the board have any questions or comments on, the, on this application? Jim, I have a motion for consideration. Yep, please continue. Uh, motion for the board to consider findings of fact that the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a resource protection permit to install 1,100 square feet of boardwalk on the existing town farm trails located at the town farm of Spurwink Avenue, R511, R513, which requires review under section 19-8-3, resource protection regulations. Number two, the application was deemed complete at the May 18th, 2021 planning board meeting, the completeness finding includes waivers for providing one inch to, or one foot, excuse me, to, or one, yeah, one inch uh, topographic contours, uh, a high intensity survey, soil survey and a stormwater management plan prepared by a professional engineer, which are granted due to the size, or excuse me, the limited size of the project and the limited change in existing conditions, including no change to existing ground topography. Number three, the boardwalk will um, will not material uh, materially obstruct the flow of surface or subsurface waters across or from the alternation area. Number four, uh, the boardwalk will not impound surface waters or reduce the absorption capacity uh, of the alteration areas so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties. Number five, the boardwalk uh, will not increase the flow of surface waters across or the discharge of surface waters from the alternation area so as to threaten injury uh, to the alternation area or to upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. Number six, the boardwalk will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitat for aquatic life, birds, or other wildlife. Number seven, the boardwalk will not pose problems related to the support of structures. Number eight, the boardwalk will not be detrimental to aquifer uh, recharge or the quantity or quality of groundwater. Number nine, the boardwalk will not disturb coastal dunes or contiguous uh, back dune areas. Number 10, the boardwalk will not maintain, uh, excuse me, will maintain or improve ecological and aesthetic values. Number 11, the board boardwalk will promote vegetation recovery to support an adequate buffer area between the wetland and adjacent land uses. Number 12, the boardwalk 
uh, will not result in removal of vegetation and therefore will be accomplished in conformance with the erosion prevention provisions of the Environmental Quality Handbook Erosion and Sediment Control published by the Maine Soil and Water Conservation Commission dated March 1986 or subsequent revisions thereof. Number 13, the boardwalk uh, will discharge wastewater from, uh, excuse me, um, will not discharge wastewater from buildings or from other construction into wastewater treatment facilities in violation of section 15-1-4 of the sewage ordinance. And the boardwalk uh, is not uh, located in a floodplain. Might need help with that one. Um, number 15, the application substantially complies with section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for a resource protection permit to alter 1,100 square feet of RP1 and RP2 wetlands to install boardwalk on the existing town farm trails located at the town farm on Spurwink Avenue be approved. Thanks, Jonathan. Second. You got a second? second. Okay. Second. We, uh, we got a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Uh, seeing none, uh, Maureen, I, I, please. Oh. I, I do have a question for Maureen, and I know this, this is nitpicky, but I, like Jonathan, kind of stumbled on the floodplain. Yeah. Because it's awful close, but. Yes, is it, it is. True? Is it true that it is not, not? It is not in, yes. Okay. okay. Right. So I guess right. <laughs> I, I well, it's a 50 shot. <laughs> If it was in the floodplain, it would need a flood permit. All right. Okay. okay. So we'll call, please call the roll, Maureen. Certainly. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yeah. Mr. I think we lost him. Oh, no, there he is. He's on mute. Hi. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, okay. Thank Next you all question. very much. What's that? Thank you all very much. Yes, thank you. Um, next item, item three, 287 Ocean House Road Site Plan Amendment. Michael Friedland is requesting amendments to the previously approved site plan for 287 Ocean House Road, U22-76 to delete the finished paving coat, revise the outdoor storage and expand the outdoor display hours. Section 19-9 site plan uh, public hearing. So I don't know, Michael, or do you have somebody with you to uh, present the changes? Uh, I'm still promoting. Okay. We could just... Give me a moment. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, Maureen. I'd like to pass it over to Jamie Wagner to start. And uh, then after he's done speaking, I'll speak. And if you could pull up the site plan, that would be awesome too. You don't want to take over and handle it yourself? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure how <laughs> uh, is the best way to say it. I think it'd be better if I handed it over to you. Well, that assumes I know how. Um, so I think Jamie should be set and let me pull up your site plan. Can you hear me, Maureen? Yes. Yeah. Great. Go ahead, Jamie. Hi, Jim. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as with the last meeting, I'm limiting my comments to the issue of the top coat um, or the surface course of pavement on the Lumberies parking lot. The applicant believes that it's a, an unnecessary expense and that there is nothing in our town ordinance that requires it. The applicant's not asking you to ignore ordinance. He'll comply with the ordinance. He's requesting not to be economically burdened with a line item that's not required by ordinance or necessary to his business plan. So as I explained in more detail in our last meeting, 
this top coat isn't required by any town ordinance. Neither the town engineer nor the code enforcement officer has said that the CAPE ordinance requires the top coat. There's likely a reason for that. If the ordinance required a top coat, the code enforcement officer and the town engineer would have informed the planning board of such a requirement. It simply isn't required. At our last meeting, Mary Ann Lynch raised another potentially applicable ordinance section. That provision is in section 19-7-8 entitled off-street parking. Section 19-7-8 is found in the ordinance at pages 183 through 189. The relevant wording appears on page 189 of the ordinance and says, quote, number six, all parking areas shall be designed to adequately control drainage. In furtherance of this standard, drainage calculations used shall reflect the paved condition and all parking areas shall be constructed with base material, which can withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance. As you'll hear from Brandon, he'll go into more detail on this after I'm finished. The Lumbery's site plan was designed to adequately control drainage and the parking area was, was designed and constructed with a base material which can withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance. Indeed, the town engineer's latest letter dated June 8th, 2021 states in his overview that quote, the base or lower layer of pavement has characteristics, parentheses, aggregate size, asphalt content, et cetera, close parentheses, that make it suitable for structural loading. This appears to go directly to Mary Ann Lynch's request regarding whether the parking lot can handle the expected vehicle load. The town engineer then continues on to explain why he would recommend a top coat which you can summarize as essentially not having a top coat will give the pavement a shortened lifespan and that potholes and pavement unraveling will develop sooner. In other words, you're going to have to maintain it earlier than if you had a top coat. Again, as we discussed at the last meeting, that is a business issue and a financial issue for the applicant. It shouldn't be a planning board issue. Uh, finally, I want to respectfully remind the members of the planning board that ordinance section 19-9-5, starting at page 270, discusses the approval standards for site plans. And on page 271, it states that, quote, application shall be approved unless the planning board determines that the applicant has failed to meet one or more of these standards. In law, the word shall is not permissive or discretionary language. The word shall here mandates an approval if the applicant meets the standards. I submit that the applicant has satisfied the requisite standards and should be approved with the amendments. I wanna thank all the members of the board for carefully considering the applicant's request and I appreciate your time and effort very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Brandon, uh, you're up. Yeah, I'll take over from there. So I'm Brandon Minette. I'm here with NCS on behalf of uh, Yam Yam LLC or also known as Michael Freeland. Um, so I'll kind of hit the pavement uh, waiver request last. I do kind of want to point out, I guess, some changes from last time. Um, I guess the biggest ones to point out are the conditions of approval. If you'll notice on uh, the display, you'll see that eight and 11, they'll be red. Those have actually been changed uh, to kind of modify what we are asking for. Um, I do want to make a quick note that we will change in note 11, the site plan dated March 1st, 2021 to either the latest uh, de minimis change plan or the one that was approved by the planning board. Uh, I'm sure we can work with the uh, staff on that to put the date down that they require to best be for their recording. Um, to kind of recap a little bit what we talked about last time, just in case we've forgotten, um, we are asking for a six foot tall stockade fence for storage on the north side of the building. Uh, do keep in mind that this storage area will have an open and closed gate, you know, for a little bit more protection, you know, from you know, theft and that kind of thing. Also shielding any kind of storage during non-business hours. Uh, it does eliminate some parking, but 
we are meeting the parking requirements by double. So we propose 16 and you're only required to have eight. Um, also on the back side of the building, uh, the southwest corner, we're asking for an eight foot tall stockade fence. So storage can be hidden in the back and it won't be seen from the public. It'll also keep people out of the back of the building. Um, Excuse me, uh, Brandon, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to make it clear. I think you just, I think you just switched the height. The six foot is at the rear. The eight foot is on the side. Oh, thank you. Yes, I did mix that up. Eight foot is on the north side of the building for the larger storage and six on the back. My apologies. Thank you for correcting me. Um, I also want to point out the bike rack has been moved to the front in some of the kind of grass area right next to the walkway. Uh, it'll make for a safe transition into the front of the building uh, because obviously that was taken out from the storage area previously. Um, I will point out again the storage, con it's called proposed concrete storage pad. Um, but that actually refers to note 11. It's going to be for just potted plants. Um, this particular area will not uh, kind of impact any ADA standards. It won't block anything. And this is a slightly risen concrete pad that's already on site. So no plant should be in the roadway or anything of that nature. Uh, it should be pretty clear where it is. <laughs> so uh, that kind of area is pretty, pretty well delineated. Uh, on the plan. Uh, lastly, I kind of want to talk about the pavement striping that was removed out front of that proposed concrete storage area that was discussed that was removed off the last plan, as well as the old note that talked about and had some conflicts with some of the new conditions was removed. You can see it was actually quoted in your packet, um, that particular quote. Uh, Lastly, I'm going to talk about the kind of address the comments and the pavement issue. So we are asking a waiver of the 1.25 inch top asphalt coat uh, or wear coat. Um, what was laid down was about three inches and it was rolled and put the proper specification, which you can see in uh, Mr. Harding's comments that it is about 2.75 ish inches which is about half an inch actually uh, more than what we requested in our detail. Um, kind of to talk about a history of the site, to get an idea of what it can really handle is most of the structural integrity does come from uh, the underlining uh, gravel base course. Uh, that whole entire site previously was a gas station. So we had tankers actually running across it. Uh, that was done years and years over. So it's going to be able to handle any kind of new truck loads that's going to go across it. Um, another comment I kind of want to point out that Steve brought up is about the V-wrap. Um, we put the standard detail showing the 15 inches of type D gravel and then three inches of type A and then your asphalt coats. Uh, that is for the case of only if full construction was needed. Talking with the paver, uh, he was not allowed to excavate. He did not excavate the whole site as Steve may have be uh, confused about or may have taken it that way. Um, that was there in case he did need to uh, build up any material around the edges of pavement. He said only in one real area there was erosion and he had to do at least 15 inch lift to make sure that it was structurally sound. I did ask what he particularly did over the site that was not you know, excavated and was not torn up and how he kind of handled that issue. Um, he did write a letter saying that everything was done to proper specifications and that he was more than confident that it would be able to handle the loads of forklifts and any other trucks or vehicles on that kind of pavement. Uh, mostly he brought in, he said, average of three inches across. He kind of skimmed it and made it uh, level so drainage would kind of flow off, but also keep the grades that were proposed. He said it was rolled and compacted to make sure it would meet proper specifications and it would absolutely handle any kind of forklifts or trucks that will roll across it. Then he laid three inches of asphalt, then it was rolled, which would come out to your 
picture of a, a little less than three inches, but still more than the required uh, bottom coat that we pointed out in our, specif our standard specification. Uh, so I do want to make clear that the site was not actually excavated, uh, talking with the paver. Um, that being the case, over the years, it's going to be able to handle any kind of issue of heavy structural problems. Jamie pointed out as well that uh, the town reviewing engineer seemed to be, you know, at least he understood that it's going to hold up to it and pavement's rather soft, I guess. So the bottom structural part was, is already taken in consideration. Uh, talking with the paver as well, he actually didn't want to <laughs> excavate because he said it would actually ruin the structural integrity because those years and years of rolling vehicles over the old gravel will, will make it stronger. Uh, so he's actually wanted to keep it and he did and he used that kind of as a subgrade material and just went right over the top of it. Um, that really is kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I don't think there was anything else that I can completely think of right now. I'm going to open it up to any questions and if you well, got next, thing, next thing next thing we'll do is going to open up for a public hearing Brandon so sure you know, the, if if Jamie or Brandon any other comments are you all set okay thank you um, and I'll open up uh, to a public for any comments so if if anybody wants the same thing, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom so uh, you will jump to the top of my queue. Okay, seeing none, um, I'll close the public hearing. Um, so then I'll, and I'll open it up to the board to see what questions they may have. Again, please use the raise hand feature because the way it is on my screen, I can't see everybody. Jonathan. Uh, so Brandon, uh, no, you guys don't have any renderings of what this, uh, the stockade fence uh, when you're facing the building is gonna look like? I have a detail actually on page, it says sheet five of five, uh, that'll kind of give you an idea of what you're really working with. Um, I can tell you it's that standard stockade fence, you know, you have your, it, it pretty much covers everything. There's no holes in it. Usually it's is, wood. Um, is it gonna be like the natural color, sort of like the building already looks right now? I'm assuming that's what he's gonna match to. I know it's going to be wood. Uh, cause that's what it calls out. And since he is a lumbery and it has kind of that nice finish on the front of the building already, I would assume he's going to match a very similar color. Um, he's done a great job so far of making, in my opinion, making the building look really, really presentable. Um, and I'm sure he would carry that out as well, especially since he's a lumbery, you probably want to show off some of the, the skills and wood that, uh, he can kind of provide for his clients. So yeah. I would assume that's the case. Um, and one other question I had uh, related to that, it, it, the, all, the idea of that is to basically put all the storage of the things that are being sold, um, like the, the large items behind that. Uh, when you drive by right now, it almost looks like there's where there's a lot of piles of lumber for sale. It extends where the fence will go. So I just want to make sure that if the idea is that this, this lumber for sale is gonna go behind this fence, that the lumber for sale will be behind the fence as opposed to the gate open all the time, it sort of meandering in the parking lot. Um, so I just would like assurance from you or the applicant that that's the idea behind this fence before we go approving the fence. Yeah, sure. So uh, you might have recalled that concrete pad that's in the storage area was originally supposed to be where storage was supposed to go. Um, as with all businesses, they kind of found out that it doesn't cover everything. Uh, it, he has more than he was expecting. Uh, so that's why we are putting that fence there. And to my knowledge, and the whole idea is to keep it really hidden from a uh, view of the public driving by and it's supposed to all be behind this fence for security as well as um, 
you know, kind of aesthetically pleasing look. I do agree that perhaps maybe it's outside of it now. He maybe not doesn't know where those boundaries are, and that's okay. But once that fence is up, he's going to pull it completely from that uh, corner of the building, carried off until it reaches that kind of parking spot. Yeah, I I would agree that it would not be a good idea, and it shouldn't happen that lumber is outside of that gate uh, simply because that when the flow of traffic and you know having an obstacle in the middle of the parking lot is <laughs> is not a good idea um so i know talking with the applicant he his plan is to have everything inside of there uh including his forklift um if he's to have one on site that's that's supposed to be everything is behind there that's also the whole reason that we have uh the storage in the back of the building with that six foot tall stockade fence as well uh so nothing is really uh, in the public view. And yes, that gate opens while the store is open and it's supposed to be closed during uh, non-business hours. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, Andrew. Yeah, um, was it the fact that, were they, was Maureen asking that 11B or somebody asked that 11, uh, note 11B removed or revised? I don't want to speak for Maureen. I think she's saying the date of the plan, the site plan date needs to be revised. Hold on. Let me I kind that. of wonder if we need 11 at all. It doesn't make really any sense to have it. If you're talking about storage inside the fenced area and then that pad is in this fenced area, why would we need to describe it? It's almost like superfluous and maybe possibly confusing. And maybe I'm interpreting this incorrectly, but it almost doesn't matter what goes on that pad if you're talking about outside can storage? I respond to that? Yeah. Can I respond to that? If yes. you drive by there now, you'll see uh, uh, shelves with potted plants sitting on that that spot they're talking about. That outside storage that's allowed that, that concrete storage pad. That's what's being talked about here, not the storage behind the fence. Well, I thought he said it was the storage pad that the the concrete pad. There are two storage. There are two concrete pads. I'm really one of confused. them is part of the original approval, and it's on the north side of the building. And I can't so point that to one. Okay. Building. And the other is that triangle that's part of the park. Looks like it's in the parking lot. Okay. Where there are currently potted plants being displayed. Andrew, on the uh, site plan, it actually shows where it says C conditions of approval note number eleven in the in front of the building oh yeah okay i see that now all right yeah i missed that uh, all right i just thought it had been pointed out earlier that it was they were talking about the concrete pad but okay i see that now yeah all right that's 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 fine that's clear then um and i believe maureen wanted the date modified. yes okay yeah just modify the date yeah that makes sense all right um i just was a little bit confused but I can, uh, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, note 11 makes it clear that only potted plants are there. That's in the front of the building on that kind of, uh, it's called out as proposed concrete storage in pad area. Um, this is to really make it clear that you can't just throw mulch or other materials out in this area. Um, yeah. That's really what note 11 is trying to make clear as well as those boundaries are there that it cannot be put in any kind of right away in the road. And it also cannot uh, impact, you know, walkway areas. Um, you can see that there's a there's a specific spot out front of the building that you can walk, or, you know, right out front, not mess with any ADA standards, anything like that. Uh, that's really why that's there. Uh, I just wanted to make that clear. And I do apologize if I didn't make that clear earlier. Um, but yes, that's what uh, Note 11 is uh, kind of showing that only potted plants are there. I guess I had one more comment. Um, I'm struggling with this whole pavement thing because it seems like overwhelmingly the engineers uh, recommendations in general is to have that top coat. I mean, the reason why it's there is, I think, as far as I can tell, is because that is a standard. So I, I think basically when the plan was put together, it was sort of like, yes, there should be a cop coat. That's what we always do. And so sort of backing away from that, frankly, gives me pause. And you know, the town engineer clearly 
is very against that notion, as is um, the, it was the town engineer and um, public works director. Public works director. So I'm just, I'm really struggling with this. I, I get the finance financials of this, but it just seems like it's a slippery slope for us. And, and it's, you're right, it's not exactly laid out in, in the standards, but the fact of the matter, it ended up there because it is a standard practice of engineering. So for me, I, I don't feel like that we should allow this change. I mean, the site plan was approved. So we're, you know, it's been said that we didn't approve the, you know, we should approve this because we shall or whatever, but we've already approved it. This is just talking about changing something in an amendment. So th that's my comment. I don't know how the rest of the board feels about this, but. Well, we'll find out. Al, I see your hand up. Thanks, Jim. The attorney referenced, um, I believe section 19-7-8 regarding all parking areas shall be constructed with base material, which can withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance. I believe you can draw a reasonable connection between the sections quoted by the town planner and the town engineer to the subdivision ordinance. But if we look at this section specifically, was there a geotechnical report conducted that included pavement design that was submitted as part of the original site plan approval? And that's a question for Brandon. Uh, no, a geotechnical report was not submitted uh, for this particular uh, request of waiver. Uh, I do wanna kind of add on that uh, as you know, gravel roads and gravel parking lots do hold up. And I know the structural integrity was kind of one of those issues uh, with a good gravel base, it will be able to hold up. Um, and it does have a slightly thicker asphalt coat uh, than we previously delineated on the plan detail. Um, that being the case, I would have to turn it over to Jamie to talk to the uh, nope. aspect. I still have the floor. So right. the, yeah. the answer to the question is no, you did not submit a geotechnical report. That's correct. That provided any information to support the waiver request. Have you submitted pavement design calculations to support that the pavement and base material as installed would meet section 1978. No. All right. Based on that, I don't think the applicant has met their burden of demonstrating that they have complied with the ordinance and therefore I will support the staff position to not waive the surface course pavement. Thank you, Al. You all, you all set? Yes, thank you, Jim. Mary Ann. Thank you. Um, I'll be supporting the applicant's uh, request with respect to the paving. A, a waiver is generally regarded as a request for relief from a legal requirement. And I've spent an awful lot of time looking at the ordinance over the last two months. And uh, as uh, Jamie Wagner pointed out, I brought up the general standards of the zoning code uh, at our meeting last month, section 19-7-8 sub six, which speaks directly to parking. And it says all parking shall be designed to adequately control drainage. All parking areas shall be constructed with base materials, which can withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance. And the only other, um, there is no other, provision in our town ordinances with respect to parking lots. There's a lot of specificity on paving for roads and collectors and various other things. But with respect to parking, the only legal requirement that I can find is in 19-7-8. What we're being asked to do is to 
um, support the staff in a practice that they have developed over the years, but a practice does not have the weight of law. You know, I'm particularly struck in light of the fact that many businesses in this town don't even have paved parking areas. There are a number of businesses with unpaved parking. And in light of no legal requirement in the town ordinances, I suggest that we should be supporting the applicant's request. And I would just point out that he did submit a letter from DNR paving and that paving uh, person said, it is my professional experience it is with my professional experience and knowledge that the proper preparation and asphalt costs were done to provide a quality product that will last for years to come and does not pose a safety concern. So with all of that in mind, I'll be supporting the applicant's request not to add a second coat of paving. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Jonathan. Um, I'll be supporting the applicant's request for the, the stockade fence on both sides. Um, I will not be supporting the applicant's request for the paving uh, to not do the surface layer. Uh, just as this is the fun part about um, interpretation of statutes because or ordinances, because I read 19-7-8 when it says in number six, um, that uh, it shall reflect a paved condition. Now, see, my definition is that this is not a paved condition. This is halfway paved uh, because a saw, uh, as the town engineer points out, uh, it does not have a surface coat, which is industry standards uh, done for the purposes of safety. And because of that, I not I do not believe that the applicant has his parking lot right now um, as in a paved condition. Uh, which was a requirement, and I'm not going to be supporting his request to not do the surface layer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jamie, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you, Jim. <clears throat> um, first, I want to address Mr. Sarbeck's uh, statement regarding the pavement and the interpretation of statute. Um, I think it's very important to note that the words paving and pavement are not defined in Cape Elizabeth ordinance anywhere under the definition section 19-1-3. As Brandon and any other construction engineer can tell you, there are several types of pavement and paving materials and the Cape Elizabeth ordinance does not specify what type of paving that is called for. Um, regarding Mr. Palmer's comments, I respectfully disagree with Mr. Palmer. Um, the burden his suggestion would raise the burden on the applicant beyond what is provided in ordinance. And I don't think that's appropriate for a planning board to increase the burden uh, beyond what's required by ordinance. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think it's allowed uh, under the approval standards for the site, uh, site plans under section 19-9-5. I think you'd be acting ultra various uh, outside of the law. Um, I, I appreciate Marian Lynch's statement regarding other businesses. And I think it's worthwhile talking about some of the other businesses in the town and also in the town center. Um, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is a nonprofit uh, that has right in the town center across from the IGA Plaza and a relatively recent um, construction that is not a paved uh, entrance to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. That's a dirt or gravel uh, condition for that driveway, for that parking lot. Um, the Lobster Shack, a business that's a kind of a beat up, rutted, um, dirt parking lot uh, used by patrons all summer long, very busy spot. Um, Kettle Cove Ice Cream, dirt, right? Uh, Norm Jordan, right in the center of town, town center. He sells plants to people every day dirt. Um, Jordan's Farm, right? Jordan's Farm on Wells Road. The well at Jordan's Farm. Those are all dirt parking lots that people use every single day. Um, Alewives Brook Farm, probably the most rutted uh, road in Cape uh, that people drive down to buy their lobsters um, regularly. So it's uh, 
in fact, in pavement, you know, with asphalt might be the more the exception than the rule for town businesses. So I think it's very important to factor all of these town businesses in, and we're not making some exception for the lumbery. We're just treating him like any other applicant. He's asked for an exception to his own original site plan that he realizes, you know, that that's not necessary. And it's an extra expense of twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars that I would rather not spend on that um, luxury to put a top coat on an already structurally sound uh, base coat. So I think when you factor all of that in, I, I would um, before you do roll. I hope that the people that are considering voting against it would reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Marianne. Thank you. I'll try not to belabor things, but um, the subdivision ordinance, which is referred to earlier, is very specific about paving with respect to arterial roads, collector roads, rural connector roads, feeder roads, local roads, and sidewalks. Again, it's silent on paving for parking lots, which I think then just sends you back to the general ordinance at 19-7-8. So I just wanted to be clear that um, where the town council wanted to be specific with respect to paving, technical paving requirements, it was very specific. And then with respect to a parking lot, it was not as specific and left a general standard um, that can withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance. The last thing I would say is with respect to, if you want to say that somehow the subdivision ordinance paving arterial collector feeder and local road requirements somehow are impressed upon a parking lot then I would suggest that the waiver provisions in the subdivision ordinance then come into play. And the planning board can waive when they find undue hardship, practical difficulties, or restriction upon imaginative and otherwise desirable design. Um, and you can waive it so long as it doesn't create a hazardous traffic condition or less sanitary sewage disposal conditions. Uh, you can waive it as long as it will uh, not impair the standards of road design and construction, and that's road design, not parking lot design. So uh, that's all, I'll stop there, but um, I think it's very clear that a parking lot is not a road and that the town ordinance has been very general. And I appreciate Jamie's comments about the number of businesses that don't have um, paved parking lots. And uh, to this day, I, no one has suggested that somehow it's unsafe to pull into the uh, cell office building or to the Norm Jordan farm stand um, into a dirt parking lot. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, Al, I see your hand up. Thanks, Jim. Right now, we're being asked to waive a requirement based on a opinion. Requirement. There's a requirement under Section 1970 that it be paved and it withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance. We have a public works director and a town engineer who have rendered opinions that they don't think it's adequate. We have the applicant's engineer and the applicant's contractor who say it is adequate adequate. The applicant's engineer can do a technical study using the AASHTO standards to support whether or not, as installed, it meets an applicable standard, a technical study, not an opinion. They submitted the site plan with it. If they want us to remove it, I think they need to give us something more than just their opinion to support it. So that's why I'm gonna vote against it. Thank you, Al. Daniel. 
Right. A um, couple things. Um, so I, I just want to make sure I'm, this is a question to Maureen. Maureen, are you are, are we 100 percent sure that there's nothing in the zoning ordinances that talks about parking lot um, you know, design requirements? Well, most of the design in the zoning ordinance, it's section 1978, okay. the off parking section. That's Fine. that's the main section. OK, I just want OK. Um, and then just a comment. Um, so when Northeast or when the uh, when Northeast Civil Solutions originally put this plan together, I'm just thinking because I'm in that world. You know, why didn't they, you know, look at uh, and consider the ex you know doing an existing conditions assessment of that parking lot and, and um, do that Ashto test. Um, I'm not familiar with that, but just kind of, you know, do that initial uh, consulting, do your job and then recommend, hey, you know, we don't need that top coat. Right now, I'm probably not going to be voting. I'm probably going to vote against approving, you know, the change unless they go back and, and probably do an analysis. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, um, Jamie. Yeah, just regarding Mr. Bodansky and uh, Mr. Palmer's concerns. Um, Mr. Palmer asked for a geotechnical report. Um, you know, in a perfect world, I suppose, with never ending supplies of money, we could do uh, treat the lumbery like it's main Yankee nuclear power plant, but it's not. It's just a small business in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And I don't think that the ordinance requires a geotechnical report. Uh, it doesn't state that in the ordinance. I think that by making that statement, you're um, increasing the burden on the applicant beyond what's acceptable under the terms of the ordinance. So I, I just think that it's not appropriate for the planning board to expand beyond the terms of the ordinance. And that's what you would be doing if you required a geotechnical report uh, and you'd be further burdening the applicant. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Maureen, I've got a question for you. Um, Jamie mentioned several businesses that have dirt parking lots. If they were to do something that would require site plan review, would the town require them to pave those parking lots? Um, I'm glad you asked, Jim, because some of those businesses have received site plan review and some have not. And so the CELT did receive site plan review. They submitted a standard for a gravel parking lot. When you install a gravel parking lot, you're not gonna pave it the type and amount of gravel you install is a little different using the subdivision ordinance. The lobster shack, um, I think they have a site plan review. Uh, the Kettle Cove ice cream does not. Uh, Norm Jordan does not. The Jordan's farm in the well, they do have site plan review. They proposed a gravel parking lot and they gave specifications for how they would build that. Ailes Wife Brook Farm also has site plan review. They, they said it was going to be gravel and they provided specifications like so for that. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. All right. Um, Jamie? Yeah, no, I think that's helpful what Maureen just said. That, that goes to Jonathan's question about pavement, right? Because in that event, then none of those parking lots that Maureen just discussed that were gravel were paved under Mr. Sarbeck's definition of pavement. But I don't think that's what uh, Maureen is suggesting. I'm assuming that those are still compliant with the, the ordinance, um, but per perhaps not, maybe they're not compliant. Um, but but uh, that, that's the point. You don't have a definition of pavement. And when you have an ambiguous ordinance, then it's construed against the drafter and the drafter is the town of Cape Elizabeth. So I think that this should be approved uh, with a request of amendment. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Jonathan. 
Oh, wait, I see Maureen got her hand up. Go ahead, Maureen. Yeah, I, 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 I just don't want my words to be used against the town and used against the planning board and pushing the board members to go in one direction or another. Let's just be clear. When the planning board has approved and staff has reviewed gravel parking lots, they've used the private road standards in the subdivision ordinance. And in the subdivision ordinance, you are allowed to have a private road that is gravel if it's constructed to a certain manner and you have to provide a specification for that. And the town engineer has reviewed that and approved that using the subdivision ordinance standard for pavement and gravel buildup. So, you know, either it's okay to use a subdivision ordinance or it's not. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Sure. Oh, Jonathan. Oh, no, one thing is that the town center has a lot of different zoning ordinances compared to other places. Um, but just as Jamie just pointed out, and I appreciate his advocacy for the applicant, obviously, I think he's doing a good job. Um, at the same time, though, I, when somebody says I'm going to pave this, I expect it to be paved to the engineering standards that uh, the industry holds uh, for safety reasons. And when I'm reading the town engineer report, who we've obviously used on basically every site plan review that I've uh, looked at over the years, um, I'm going to give a lot of credence to what that person says. Um, and just lastly, the point of what Al was saying with regards to the um, asking for that study is more for not to add a burden to the client, but it's a, or the applicant, but actually to for the applicant to back up these claims that are being that are being said that this is perfectly safe and that one only one coat of pavement. Uh, is is adequate and there is no need for a top coat. So I think that that's what um, Al was saying with regards to wanting to see that information. And I don't think that's putting a burden at all on the applicant. It's basically requesting him to back up his claim uh, of why a top coat wouldn't be needed. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Anything else? Anybody else? Um, at this time, unless my mind has changed, uh, using the arguments made by Jonathan and Al, I will be voting against the, uh, the waiver for the top coat. Um, I also, uh, I don't know if Jonathan, somebody else said it. Um, I mean, you're putting up that eight foot high stockade fence. I just switched subjects on you. you know, and, um, and I think Jonathan, again, and when I drive by, there's no way you're going to get all that stuff behind that stockade fence. So I've, I've two minds. One, why bother having it if you're not going to put everything behind it? Because it adds no value in my mind, unless it's uh, somebody worried about somebody walking off with it, uh, with the materials. Um, and if, if you know you're going to have all that material out there, change the design of the stockade fence so it will all be behind it. Um, that, that's my thoughts right there. Uh, I do have some questions on the plan, uh, Brandon. Let's see. Um, I'm looking at the, on sheet three of five, uh, conditions of approval. Um, let's see, number four, uh, this may be more of a procedural thing. But, and Maureen, the town actually put in that light, not the applicant. Is that correct? Um, partially. The town made an offer to the applicant to handle the installation and the applicant paid for it. So um, the applicant wrote a check and he gets credit for that light and the okay. town arranged for the installation so they get credit for how good it looks. Okay. All right. Also, the, the last line on number, uh, note number four, C light pole location note on sheet three of five. I can't find that unless uh, there's an, a subsequent uh, a subsequent drawing, but this is one that was, I got in the mail last week. So, so yes, the, the, the applicant has been advised that they don't have to submit the entire set. They only have to submit plans that have been changed from the original approval. So we are going at, um, Trust that sheet three does not need to be changed. 
but it doesn't show where the light pole at all is. Yeah. Unless unless the location is wrong, proposed light pole per municipal specification is right off the end of the pathway. Right. I don't see anything there. There's a little symbol with an arrow pointing to it. I could do what if I got a bed. Okay, never mind. I was I'm wrong. Assuming that's where the light installation is. Okay. All right. I missed that. Um, okay, the next one. Let's see. You talk about on note six. Um she revised planning schedule on sheet four or five. I guess uh, we don't have sheet four or five, but I'm not sure that's relevant. Maureen, is that is that germane? I, I, again, again, uh, in an effort to minimize the burden on the applicant when an, a, a plan has been approved and amendments come in, we allow them only to submit the sheets that are going to be revised. Okay. So we're kind of going on the honor system here that sheet four or five hasn't been revised. This is why it's so important for the applicant to provide a letter to the board that says, these are the things we're asking to change. And in the letter from the applicant, there's no proposal to change landscaping. Is that correct, Brandon? Yes, that is correct. Nothing okay. has changed on sheet four. Uh, notes one through seven are the already approved notes and same with nine and 10. Uh, the ones that, I'm not, if you have a black and white copy are gonna be gray, so which is eight and 11. Those are the only ones that have actually been changed at all. Um, and that was something that was done to try and help the board along to make sure that there was no confusion. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned that. If I didn't, I apologize. Uh, but eight and 11 are the only two that have actually changed under conditions of approval. Okay. Hey Maureen, based on, uh, we had a discussion after a generic discussion, not specific to this project at our last workshop, I believe about the com uh, having a complete set of plans uh, so that Ben can adequately enforce the, the conditions. Um, trying to figure out how to ask this question. Is, is the plan as it stands right now, my first impression is it's not complete and needs to be changed uh, so, updated to reflect everything correctly. Is that right? We have, when the board approved this last July, the applicant was required to revise the plans to reflect all of the conditions on that July approval and they were not able to obtain a building permit until that had been completed. So we now have in the office one complete set of the plans dating back to the July approval. Now the applicant is asking for these new changes and has provided us a new site plan and a new sheet, three, three of five, is it's the detail sheet anyway. So in theory, we can take out the site plan sheet that we already have on file and replace it with a new um, amended sheet. We can take the detail sheet that we already have on file and replace it with this detail sheet. The challenge is if the board is going to move ahead with approvals tonight, um, there are two conditions that are proposed. One of them is um, this note 11, where it refers to a site plan date that doesn't exist. Uh, the date exists, the site plan doesn't. Um, and then uh, there's a request that a note be added to the plan that no display items be placed in the right of way. And then if the board is going to go ahead um, on the top coat, um, the applicant has provided a detail of the, the, the um, pavement and they have um, at my direction provided a detail that reflects what they have asked for. So if the board does not approve that detail, that this, this page needs to be revised. Okay. Um, thank you, Maureen. Sure. And getting, getting back to the, the paving issue, what, are we, what is the planning board setting? Our, are we setting ourselves up for failure in any future project um, where there's a parking lot and, and uh, they may, you know, if somebody comes in and says they're going to do this and then they don't and they want relief, is that, uh, are we going to 
be forced to always grant waivers? Uh, there, there's no, I mean, there's no limit to what an applicant can request for the board to change. Uh, and it, it's up to the board to either say yes or no. So could every single applicant from now on ask you not to have to do certain things? Yes. And you will have to decide whether um, you're gonna be willing to grant that or not. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay. I think so. Marianne. Hey, uh, I just wanna uh, state that, uh, or keep in mind that we just uh, approved an application by the town, which contained a request uh, last month for a number of waivers, which were granted. So uh, the ordinance provides for waivers and uh, there, there's nothing wrong with granting them. I think this suggestion that it's a slippery slope is, uh, is not really appropriate given that we've just approved an application earlier this evening, which had a number of waivers. So I, uh, again, I'll be supporting this. I, I just feel that we're being a little bit uh, arbitrary and capricious when I look at the parking lots around town and the businesses and, uh, and in the absence of specific language in our ordinance governing parking lots, um, any, uh, or I shouldn't say in the absence of specific language, but where there is specific language that just says it can withstand normally expected vehicle loading and winter maintenance, very general language, we ought to be granting this application. Thank you, Marianne. Andrew. So I, I wanna make two clarifications. The slippery slope comment was really in reference to the parking lot paving. Well, there's two things. There, there's that and also, I mean, I think for businesses that choose to go the paving route, that they should be held to whatever the standard is for paving a commercial lot one. And I think we should do that for all projects that come before us. But secondarily, I think if you can choose to go with a gravel lot and there, there are benefits to gravel lot, it's not, in, it's not as much, much of an impervious service. It still can be somewhat, I think, but um, and, and with gravel rot, you can actually grade it or fill it with, you know, whatever sand or gravel patch you need. It's not, it's not as difficult to, to repair. And so the, I, I don't think this is an apples to apples comparison. And there are choices by these businesses and it makes sense, you know, for a farm to have a gravel lot in a lot of cases. And so, um, you know, I think we should hold businesses to a higher standard for construction of paved lots. This isn't somebody's house. And again, when I said slippery soap, I was specifically talking to reducing the standard of what the engineers believe is appropriate for, for paving a lot. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Carol Ann. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll go through. I, I'm totally in favor of the fencing and hopefully the fencing will be done in such a way that they can fit everything they need behind it because there should be nothing in front of it because that's the purpose is to provide a space for uh, materials and so they are out of view and, uh, and inaccessible at night. And I think it will look so much better than their original plan of how they were going to store materials. And um, I understand the need for doing displays outside and hopefully they don't get overwhelming, uh, especially since there are displays outside and they have not yet received approval for those displays uh, and the time that the displays may be there, but they are there. And when it comes to the parking lot, I am not an engineer. I'm not an attorney. Uh, I've been listening to the back and forth on this. I think where this fell down is in the original submission. I don't think the engineering firm did their client any service by not really studying how they would pave this parking lot 
and not providing the information that the client needed to be able to save his money then. We would not be having this discussion now. We would not have had such a lengthy discussion back in July had they come forward with information on a lesser coat and the facts and figures to support that it could withhold or hold up against the traffic that it would bear. And I am so torn on which way to go on this, but my inclination is to support the request of the client. Brilliant. Any other discussion? Um, any motion? Does anybody have a motion? Well, Jim, quite frankly, how do how do we? Yeah, I mean, I guess I am I'm, I'm at a loss. My my first inclination is since this site plan has to be updated. My first inclination is to table it and then come back when the site plan is updated to reflect all these changes. So we don't, so we put, uh, so Ben can do his job. That's my first reaction. I don't know what anybody else thinks about that. Um, and we table it and then we pick it up and look at a fresh, complete site plan. Because Maureen, again, in our uh, generic discussion a couple of weeks ago, it just puts an undue burden on Ben and he won't, you know, he won't even, try to hold an applicant to any to anything if he, if he has divergent site plans because um, it won't hold up in court. Um, so I don't know what anybody thinks about that, but Marianne, I see you have your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I had, uh, I had my hand up, I guess, to make a motion. Well then, but... Can I make a comment before she makes a motion? And I, yeah. I, I don't want to make a motion if there's going to be a motion to table because I can count to four. <laughs> <laughs> Are you suggesting, Jim, that this be tabled because what you're, what the tea leaves you are reading indicate to you that we're, going, we're all willing to approve part of this, but we're not all willing to approve the pavement part. So you're actually saying that the plan needs to be changed to reflect two different things, or are you suggesting we table this so they can bring us the facts and figures that no, the I guess. will support? What it, what's the rationale behind tabling? Well, I, I, I guess I don't know what else to do um, based on our, on our discussion after the workshop, I just want to make sure Ben has a complete site plan. We don't have different site plans around. And to, to go off on another tangent, um, Marianne's arguments have, have changed my mind. I'm a, you know, I don't like it, but I see her point and I will probably, you know, I will vote to approve the waiver. And I, Marianne, I haven't counted three or four or five yet. So I don't know where everybody stands on it, on this anymore. I know Al and Jonathan are against it, but then I think Andrew, but. Um, so any, you know, do we, do we have enough, I mean, does anybody feel comfortable making a motion based on what we have in front of us? Marianne, you had your hand up. Did you change your mind? Um, if I were going to make a motion, I would make a motion to uh, provide the applicant with uh, the amendments that he's seeking. Uh, I hate to table it another month. I feel like time is money and um, I'd like to see us approve it and we can approve it subject to his filing a um, site plan that conforms to um, the changes that the staff has talked about. Uh, Maureen, what can we do to make sure these site plans get, get, get uh, updated before anything's done? What can nothing. we- Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Uh, unfortunately, that has been our experience for some time now. I it's, guess I just, we've seen this movie before. I'm just pointing that out. 
Yeah. Andrew. Um, I just wanted to be clear that I, I will support all the other amendments. However, I would not support the removal of the paving change. So I, I didn't make that clear. I'm okay. fine with the fencing. I'm fine with everything else. So you put that in your math column. Uh, and I would say the the issue, the issue with the the plan changes and it, you know, having it be hard for Ben to uh, deal with that issue is, is a tough one. And I, I, it sounds like the only thing, according to Maureen, is 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 to do what you're suggesting, which is to say table at the next meeting and have it be completely revised. So at that point, what we're approving is what gets filed immediately. But I don't know. Um. I'd just like to point out, he's already doing everything that's on this plan except building the fence. Yeah. Oh, no, Carol Ann, he's actually not because he's not bringing in the things that he's supposed to for the outdoor display that's on the plan. Everything that's on this plan. Oh, the plan that the, on the plan that's applied for a plan. Already being done with the exception of the fence being built. Daniel, I see you have your hand up. Oh yeah, Jim, I'm I'm in favor of all the uh, requests except for the pavement request. Just so, you, just you know, so you know. But I guess the, the motion just provided us. I mean, it doesn't uh, it just talks about the amendments in in general. It doesn't say doesn't all we can we can change it. I guess, but um, Jim, I could put together a motion that would take away. The pavement part. Well, um, I'd, I'd like to see us have a vote on the pavement part. Yeah. I think we just kind of heard from everybody. Well, I don't, I, uh, Dan, I guess Al, I, I'm not quite sure. Dan, Al, Andrew, and myself are not in favor of allowing the applicant to not do the top coat. Jim, Marianne, and Carol Ann are in favor of allowing him not to do the top coat. If I'm wrong on that, please let me know. Um, so would we then require two motions? One for, for the, you know, separate the pavement out or uh, so it's clean, you know, because if right now it's just the amendments as, I, as I'm reading it right now, right? Jim, Maureen's waving her hand. Oh, I can't. She's not up in front of me. So Maureen, go ahead. Um, thank you, Al. So I understand this is a little new for you. So one of the approaches you could use is you could use a motion to table and with instructions that the following items be revised and submitted next month, which would give the applicant clear direction on what you would be willing to approve once the plans are changed. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can use whatever conditions are on this approval and say, you know, we want this done, we want this done. Any other changes you want made to the plans that are in front of you, and then and you know you mo move to table this with the expectation that these changes will be made and resubmitted next month. Okay. Um. And Maureen, tell me again, the, you, you had a couple items that needed the, the site plan does not reflect accurately, is that? Well, the, the motion in front of you has um, that note 11 needs to delete the reference to the March 1, 2021 site plan. I think if you just delete the reference, it's fine. Um, okay. Every time you put the date in, uh, we're chasing that tail. Uh, uh. And then the second item here, um, a note, and I don't know if the, the board has talked about this, but this has been a request from the uh, public works director that right now items are being put in the right of way in this area for display. And he has expressed concern that this is an area where his crew has to mow. Um, so that's what that second potential condition is. And then of course, you should have a third condition that gives the applicant direction on how you wanna handle the top coat. Okay, Al. 
relative to both items, I guess the fence and the top coat. I didn't see anything on the plan relative to timing. Obviously he's got a certificate of occupancy. Should there be some reference to, I'll use the fence. The fence shall be installed within X number of days of approval because otherwise his code's gonna be in a situation where there's no deadline. So ultimately I would think since they already have a CO, even if it's a temporary CO, there should be something that has a performance schedule to it. If it's just the fence, it would be a period to install the fence. If it's the fence and the pavement, then time frames for those so that codes isn't putting it back to us in 30 days or 60 days. Okay. Thank you, Al. Uh, Jamie? Yeah, I, I just had a suggestion maybe with regards to the pavement issue. If I heard correctly, I, I think Mr. Palmer and Mr. Bodensky had concerns about whether we've satisfied our burden on whether this, the pavement as is, as is would um, support the load bearing and winter maintenance. Perhaps we could table the pavement issue and I, I haven't spoken with the applicant yet, but give him an opportunity to submit some sort of study that satisfies that the load bearing uh, of the current as is configuration would be sufficient and for winter maintenance, then we address that uh, ordinance provision and it would allow the applicant to spend money on a study that might, he rather, might not spend, but at least it'd be less than adding the top coat. Thank you, Marianne. Oh, I think I just lowered my hand. Thank okay. you, Jim. Um, well, I guess I'm struggling with how to proceed. I am. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, to um, for the motion. Um, Jim. Um, Carol Ann has her hand up. There you go. Yeah. Go so ahead. Have a <laughs> Thank you, um, Jim. Based on what Jamie just said. And based on our discussion for how to get the plan up to date uh, before we put our final stamp on it, it sounds like tabling would be appropriate. Okay. All right. Um, can I can I make one suggestion from what Jamie just said? Uh, yep. Jamie, if you do get that study, please have it run by the town engineer. Um, and if the town engineer signs off on it, then most likely I'll sign, sign off on it as well. But when we're looking at what the town engineer and the public works director said, uh, to me, that's, uh, that's critical information. To have. Very good. Okay. All right. So we're looking at uh, right now a motion to table and the conditions with uh, a study be conducted on the structural stability of their structural capability capacity of the parking lot and uh, updating the site plan and uh, yeah, the Jim, Jim, I don't think we want to make that a requirement for the applicant because he might not want to do that or it might be cost prohibitive or something yeah exactly what I was going to say give them you know the option is either to yeah. put it in that they do the paving or they they support the non the not additional coat with the study. So that's that's their option. They would come to the table with that next, the next board meeting. Okay. All right, does anybody want to take a stab at this motion? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm thinking. Yeah, me too. The, the motion that says be it ordered can easily be converted to a tabling motion. Okay. All right. 
And you can skip the findings when you're doing a tabling motion. Yes, all right, starting there. We had ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Yum Yum's LLC for amendments to the site plan approved for 287 Ocean House Road to alter outdoor storage and eliminate a finished pavement coat be tabled to the July, is it 20? July yes. 20? The July 20, 2021 meeting, um, at which time we will review revised site plan that includes note revisions for note number 11 and the addition of a note to add added to the plan that no display items will be placed in the road right of way. And Andrew said something really good on, on the... Uh, the pavement and I lost it. So um, any any additional information on the capability of the pavement, the pavement will be entertained or something like that. Second. Okay. If someone wants to reword that, please go ahead. I remember what you said. I think said, you Andrew. did great, Carol Ann. You did great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do we have a firm enough motion here? I know we see kind of ended with something like that, but uh, I think Mary Ann seconded it, so yeah, okay. Have a roll call, um, Maureen, if you would, Mr. Bedensky, yes, Mr. Gilbert, yes, Ms. Jordan, yes, Ms. Lynch, yes, Mr. Palmer, yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes. The motion to table passes unanimously. And so we'll hopefully see it again July 20th. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, next item, agricultural amendments. Town Council has referred to the Planning Board a request to amend the site plan regulation section 19-9 to increase the size of agricultural buildings that do not require a site plan review uh, from 2,000 square feet to 3,000 square feet, section 19-10-3 uh, amendments public hearing. And Jim? Jim? Oh yeah, I, and you need to recuse myself from this. Uh, yep. This Okay. Yep. Um, so let's see. May 10th, 2021 meeting, the town council passed the following motion by a 5 nothing 5 0 vote. Ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council refers to the planning board for review and report back to the town council a request to increase the size of high tunnel slash greenhouse agricultural building section 19 9 2. And uh, it says, I'm going to start by summarizing. And I'm just going to, unless somebody has a better idea, I'm just going to read the summary that uh, we were provided here. Um, the William H. Jordan Farm is requested that the maximum size of ag agricultural buildings that do not require site plan review be increased from 2,000 to 3,000 square feet. Under the United States USDA, NRCS EQUIP program, a high tunnel of at least 2,100 square feet in size is eligible for reimbursement. The current ordinance would require a site plan review for a high tunnel of more than 2,000 square feet. The proposed revision increases the site plan exemption cap to 3,000 square feet for barns, greenhouses, and storage sheds used for agriculture. Agriculture. The planning, the planning board discussed Expanding the cap for greenhouses alone, but noted that non-agricultural buildings like a single family home garage would not require site plan review. The comprehensive plan supports farm friendly policies. At the June 1st, 2021 workshop, the planning board voted to schedule a public hearing on the agricultural amendment for June 15th. Minutes of this portion of the June 1st uh, workshop uh, have been prepared. Okay, so let's open this up for a public hearing on the 
proposed amendment. I guess anybody from the public, is, should you wish to speak, you please use the raised hand feature. We can. Jim, uh, Jim, point of order. Is there anybody from the town that's going to kind of talk to us about this, or are we just going right to public hearing? Well, I, I guess I, I didn't ask the question. Is there anybody from the town that uh, wants to talk about it? No, there isn't anybody here other than the planning board and staff. Yeah, I sensed okay. that. I went and and read that summary. I had, I had looked ahead. So. All right, sorry can, about that. Thanks. Okay. And can we clear the screen of the yam yam? Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yeah. Do you want the text of the amendment put up on the screen? Or are you good? Um, no, I think we should. You know, since it's recorded. We okay. Can put I assume you were just. I never asked. The recording. It's not just uh, audio, it does visual too, right? I believe it does. I think I was checking that at one point. Okay. That's fine. Just for the record, I guess, put that up on the screen if you can, and so it's no, there. I'm almost there. Yep. You're better than me, Maureen. I wouldn't know what to do. I think it feels even slower than it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when we do site plan review, when we do ordinance amendments, um, we usually just put up the section that is being amended. So there's other stuff here, but there is a section called site plan review, and there's a section where what's applicable, what is what requires site plan review, and what doesn't, and activities not requiring site plan review include an agricultural building that does not exceed 2000 square feet in size. And you can see that the 2000 would be eliminated and the 3000 would be added. There's a very slight yeah. spike through there. Okay. Since I've actually formally opened the, the meeting to public hearing, I guess I didn't see anybody raise their hand. So let me quickly check one more time. No. Okay, the public hearing is closed. Uh, does anybody on the plane board uh, want to dis have any discussion or questions? Andrew. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, I guess I come back to my comment from the last uh, meeting. And, and now that I see actually what, maybe I missed this the last time about what the town council was asking. I mean, they were very specifically asking to increase the size of high tunnel greenhouse agricultural buildings and to, I, I I feel like, you know, due to the law of unintended consequences that we might just want to, I think there was partly the suggestion maybe to, we could have a C1 and C2 that would basically just pull out greenhouse to increase and leave everything else at 2000 for now. But that's just my opinion. I don't know how others feel about that, given the language from the town council. Thanks, Andrew. Jonathan. I apologize. I missed the workshop on this, so some of these questions might have been answered there. But um, can someone in, in? I don't know if Carol Ed's still here, and I'm wondering if she can. I know she's recused herself, but um, I'm just trying to visualize what a 2,000 square foot building looks like and what a 3,000 square foot building looks like. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything in town like the actual barn at Jordan's farm, like how many square feet that is. I uh, just kind of looking for that visual. Um, I don't have an answer to that, answer to that, but I know Maureen, you gave, this was, I remember you saying Elaine Fallander when they were drafting this, there was a lot of discussion on the exact, or the, or the size limits on this. Right, so um, the struggle is always where the balance is to be farm friendly and uh, less and streamline our regulations without going to the point where you're allowing people to do things that might result in um, traffic or other issues. Uh, and 2000 was, was a bit of a struggle, but uh, everyone was willing to go there. The, the thing with 3000 is it really makes, um, it, it makes it possible for farmers to take advantage of this program to get subsidized with these high tunnels. I'm trying to think of, 
a building in town that's 2000 versus 3000 to just give an example um, not having uh, I mean I'm I don't know what the I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure the town hall is over 4000 so if you think of something that's half that size um, again this is these are structures that don't tend to generate uh, a lot of employees, a lot of parking demand, a lot of traffic. Okay. Um, Daniel, you have your hand up. Thank you, Maureen. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, Andrew um, actually beat me to the, uh, the point I was gonna make. And um, the town, the town council is kind of asking us to look at the high tunnels. And, and first of all, I mean, I think this is great. I think we should take it. I think it's super that that we're going to be increasing um, or allowing um, or helping our farmers take advantage of some of these um, subsidies, which, which is fantastic. But I, I, I do think, you know, I'd like to see a, a like a, you know, breaking out subsection C to um, a barn storage shed or other as like C1 and then um, and then the, uh, the the high tunnels being C2 because that's kind of what they're asking us to do. That's just, you know, that's my suggestion. Um, just curious as to see what other folks think, but I think it's a great idea. Um, and then I guess one other question uh, to Maureen. And I think maybe you, you, you'd mentioned it or you, you answered it last time. How many, or is there a limit to the number of um, barns, greenhouses or storage sheds that can be placed on a property? Not you really. Know? So we, we do have a property that's in a residential neighborhood that I believe has multiple um, greenhouses that do not exceed 2000 square feet. And I think that was one of your discussions at the last meeting. Yeah. That, um, you know, someone could build a garage in a single family home that's 2000 square feet and that wouldn't trigger site plan review. As long as they're within the set, uh, setbacks. Or... Correct, yeah, well, and if they're not within setbacks, it's still not gonna trigger site plan review. They're not gonna be able to get a building permit. Okay. So, okay. All right, thank you. I just thought I'd ask that question, yep. but that's kind of, that's what I'm thinking uh, for this modification. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Al. Just uh, to give Jonathan a little perspective, these structures typically are 24 to 30 feet in width. So it most likely would be being able to do a 120 foot long structure that's 24 foot wide versus an 80 foot long structure. So more than likely, it's just, it's most likely gonna get longer. It may get a little wider, they may go from a 24 to a 30, but these are pretty standardized and the NRCS has certain requirements for them. Part of, I believe their rationale is the end walls get expensive. So if you can go from 80 foot to 120 foot, you still only have two end walls. So theoretically, you could have two 120 foot long structures versus three 80 foot structures and you're only paying for four end walls versus six end walls. So it'd be something 24 by 80 at 2,000 square feet, 24 by 125, 120 to 125 at 3,000 square feet. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. Mary Ann, you have your hand up. Yeah, just a question for uh, Maureen getting back uh, on the issue of perspective. Uh, a, we could have a garage with a residential house that could be 4,000 square feet, right? Right, and I think I imprudently made the comment that I probably will make the mistake again that, yeah, you can do the garage, you don't run into a problem until you start putting a kitchen inside it. That's right, but um, so, but you could do that. So I just, just a question of perspective. I think there are some garages in this town that are 
on the order of 4,000 square feet, so. Okay. Um, Y'all set, Marianne? Yep, all set, thanks. Jonathan, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, thank you again, Al, for, for that perspective. And I did just kind of Google the high tunnels and the 2,000 feet and the 3,000 square feet um, tunnels. I, I, I like what Andrew and Dan were talking about was sort of parsing out the, I mean, if this is for the purposes of taking advantage of a program that, yes, I agree with Dan that we want to be able to um, have farmers be able to help themselves out, then why not kind of tailor this specific um, agricultural building to that greenhouse for 3,000 square feet in size and then keep the 2,000 square foot size for any barn or storage shed in the building footprint. I mean, it kind of makes sense to me. Okay. okay. Al, so, you, still, you still have your hand up, Al. Is that okay? Marianne, I don't know who, who spoke. It was me. It was oh, Mari. Okay. So, um, in the interest of trying to move this along, if there could be a sense of whether you want to go with C or the C1 or C2, I can redraft it while we're here. Okay. Because right now you're at three to three. I, I'm in favor of leaving it the way it is just because I don't, um, I don't want to limit the farmers on anything, but I don't know how everybody else feels. Marianne. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that, Jim, and I, I'm always concerned with the law of unintended consequences. So right. Right. I'm comfortable leaving it as general as it is in C. Okay. What Maureen, uh, and again, I apologize if you talked about this at the, uh, the workshop. How, do, when this got, when this was made, uh, what was that like? like? Was this a very long drawn out process? No, it, it wasn't. It, it, okay. Now, I mean, what we were trying to do is, again, we all know what site plan review is like. We're, we're trying to make a judgment on if you want to be a farm friendly community, are there some things you can do that make it easy for farmers to be nimble and be flexible? And the idea of being able to put up support structures without a lot of a regulatory burden, all of these still need to get a building permit. Uh, seem like a reasonable thing to do to support agriculture. And, you know, this has been in place for a while. And I don't think we've had any issues. So, you know, there was no real magic to 2000. I think the real, the real leap was saying, okay, are we, are we okay with letting people do some things without making them go through review? Okay. Any other question, Marianne, you have your hand up? I'm sorry, I forgot to lower it. Okay, um, Andrew. I, I guess the, the, to follow on what Maureen said, I mean, there's been no issues with 2,000 square feet. What we don't know is if there'd be issues with 3,000 square feet. But again, it's sort of like you can't, it's sort of unknowable. Um, but, you know, if 2,000 square feet was just pulled out of the air is just this, you know, sort of, you'd think there might've been more input than that, maybe from, from the farmer saying like, oh, geez, we're not generally gonna ever construct something more than 2000 square feet, you know, uh, footprint anyway, because we're just talking about footprint, overall structure could be 4,000 square feet or 6,000 if has three levels. But mm -hmm. so again, I always step back to probably having lesser changes, but I, I'm, you know, I. I could easily live with how, how it stands if, if, if the majority of the board certainly feels that it's fine the way it's written. And back then they may, the USDA may not have had that program. You know, it may be as simple as that too. I don't know. Um, well, any other questions or comments? Uh, do I have a motion? I'm happy to make a motion. Go ahead, Marianne. Be it ordered that based on the draft amendment and the facts presented, the planning board recommends 
the agricultural amendment to the town council for consideration. Do I have a second? Did we have the public hearing? Yes. We, did we? Yes. Yeah. Nobody, nobody yes, came. We did. We did. <laughs> no one showed. Okay. They're here. They just didn't need to speak. That's right. I'll second it. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none. Oh, you have, uh, Andrew, you have your hand up. Oh, now you don't. Maureen, please take a roll. Mr. Bedensky. Uh, no. Mr. Gilbert. Um, no. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Uh, the motion passes four to two. Um, so as I under, uh, understand it, Maureen, um, we would adjourn the meeting and then we've got a workshop, but we have one less item. Is anybody here to discuss the Town Farm Trails Resource Protection Permit in a workshop? Yes, there is. Okay. All and right. just so we're very clear, anybody who wants to be here for the workshop, just hang in there. Don't go anywhere. Okay. So we'll adjourn the meeting. So I'll, I'll need a motion for that. And then motion, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. We have a second. 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 Okay. Maureen, please call the roll. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Ms. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Palmer. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Chair Hubner. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, now we'll call the meeting, hold a workshop on Tuesday, June 15th, 2021, beginning after the regular planning board meeting, which starts at seven. And um, as a result of the COVID, not, do I need to repeat that, Mary, uh, Maureen? No. I just about said Mary Kate, my daughter's name. Sorry about that. <laughs> Maureen, do you, do we turn off the recording since it's a workshop? Oh, thank you for reminding me. Good Bless call, Johnson.